Um, I'm Joel Folku. I'm uh, working at uh, Numskill. I'm a co-founder and, and CTO of this company. Uh, we deal with a lot of C++ in our work, um, mostly because we, we mostly deal with performance issue. And uh, those performance issues that we encounter into our customers' codes or the software we try to do, um, well, they kind of forced us to, to look at C++ in a very, you know, let's say, particular way, some that's a way that remember most, most of you could find strange, but um, we need to be able to to do a lot of, you know, code generation because we need to be that close to the machine that we are sure that we get every performance inches we need. And uh, while we were doing this, and uh, some of you maybe already watched some of my other talk from the year before. Um, we have this tendency to, um, you know, use and abuse actually uh, the compilers, the compiler type systems, and those poor templates. And for a while, it was cool. Um, but as we as we went through different kind of um, scenarios, we found out that we were probably doing something stupid because, well doesn't look that elegant to do what we were doing. So spend a bunch of time actually trying to introspect what we were trying to do when we were speaking about code generation in C++. Um, I guess most of you are familiar with template metaprogramming. Raise your hand if you're not. OK, great. <laughs> Good audience. Um, it's, it's often described, you know, as more than, you know, like some kind of, you know, dark black magic things where you, you know, you pile up angry brackets and somehow a code is produced. Um, well, in fact, it's something that we think is really needed in C++ because, well, the ability to say, oh, you know, I really want to write this code this way, but, ah, well, I don't think like writing it myself. I will just let the compiler do it. It will probably do a better job than me anyway, because that's a compiler. And, you know, the best code you write is the one you don't write. Okay. And um, this notion of code generation crept its way in different places, and it took us a lot of time to actually, you know, recognize it as, as what it was, actually. Um, we inherited a bunch of techniques for using templates to generate codes, process types, all this other thing from C++ or 3. Uh, a bunch of things changed in C++ 11 and 14 and then 17. And uh, the more we look at the issue, um, well, the more these code generation things start to, to look obvious. So the question is, oh, can we actually, you know, look at what we do every day in this kind of context and uh, how can we actually structure the way we think about template metaprogramming, code generation, and so on and so on, and all the upcoming, you know, um, compile time reflection uh, features from C++ 2000, I don't know what. And uh, can we actually, right now, today, uh, use what we have to, well, to get something that looks like a code generator and not a bunch of angry brackets and try to do, you know, something interesting with that. And this notion of, well, code generation, oh, well, a lot of people try to, to do that already a long time ago. I mean, I mean, you probably f somehow are familiar with the fact that for a long time, um, the top-notch technology for code generation was writing clever macro uh, using things like boost preprocessor or chaos or things like this, um, which was okay for a lot of tasks, but, well, we lacked a bit of, you know, Finesse in the fact that the types were not actually, you know, used, just, you know, collapsing token and things. And um, there was a bunch of successful external code generator, which are mostly, you know, business related, um, turning specification from UML to a bunch of Java's, and when it's run, generate a bunch of C or something, or a lot of different kind of preprocessors, which are run externally to the actual code description. It worked. It still works in some cases, and uh, you have a lot of places where having this makes sense. And you have what, what I call this, this is dreaded metaprogramming things that for a long time, you know, I mean, it basically boiled down to that, you know. You were using function templates and class templates to express some kind of, you know, functional-like style piece of code. 
um, you were trying to embed code fragments into types that were, you know, composable in some way, and that's where the things get a bit more complicated. Um, you have to get some, you know, level of expertise uh, to get the things working, okay? And maybe after a while, the compiler will just say, okay, I'm done compiling these things, okay? And after all this compile time, uh, well, some code were written by the compiler. It was, well, it was the best what we had. Well, okay. And when I say, you know, I mean, the point three is very important, okay? You, you really have to, to know how to pronounce that because if not, most of your template doesn't work. And so a lot of people were looking at this, uh, pre C++11, and were asking the very rightful question, which is, okay, but why I am doing all of this? except for getting a more performant code, something that makes sense in terms of abstractions, and you know, well, let's say, having, having a topic of conversation, you know, when you go to parties and so on, you know. <laughs> <laughs> I'm not endorsing this, you know, I don't think, well, whatever. You may try it. Um, and in fact, something clicked in, in my head at some point, you know, because we, we look at what we were writing, I mean, writing. We were, the thing we were trying to write pre C++11, and, uh, the things that we do now, and when I say we, I'm mostly speaking about the community of people that care about template meta programming. So the three of us. And um, actually, you may be familiar with this notion. You know, you know does everybody know what, what the Moore's law is? There was this fact that every so often something doubles, which is the most generalized uh, way of putting it. And uh, something clicked. Actually, C++ template programming is following the generalized technological Moore's law. We started with basic type manipulation uh, doing C++ all three template metaprogramming, which is, can basically make sense as basic as the discovery of fire, okay? Uh, we went from a damp, dark places where you have to write all your code uh, to some place where we were actually warm and light and so on with a bunch of disadvantage, you know, like fire burns and things like this. And after a long time, people came out with, okay, we need abstraction on top of this pile of angry brackets, so why not make a library for this? And one of the first to do this was Boost MPL, which is basically the transition to Steam Engine. And in a shorter time frame, because that's where the more things come in, we got Boost Anna very recently that just revolutionized the way you think about metaprogramming, either with types of values. And if you are uh, one of the few that actually follows actively the reflection working group, you have everything which is described in Andrew Sutton's and all the other guys that work with him into uh, the PR0589 and all the subsequent papers where we basically can just tell the compiler, oh, you know, take this code, put it there, thank you. And it's another step, you know, forward this. And uh, so the question is, what did we do wrong? Well, we were focusing on type manipulation because that was the most handy resources we had when we were doing old style template meta programming. But that's wrong. We should not, I mean, types are, you know, it's a vessel to express what we want, but it should not be the main abstraction we have. And we were spending too much time playing around silly syntaxes because, you know, angry brackets, they are a bunch of funny guys. And uh, you, you still find people very, uh, you know, happily writing colon, colon type name, value type thing, thing. Okay, but it was distracting. And we have, well, we had a bunch of abstractions, but they were bad. So what we wanted to, to, to make out of this is we are generating code. So where is the code generation process hidden into all this mess? Where are the code fragments, which is this template, actually, of code you want to replicate, you want to combine, you want to apply to something? And how can we control that? And, well... We thought about the fact that we are not the first language that try to, to have a proper metaprogramming systems. Metaprogramming in C++ didn't appear by design. It's an accident. It's a little happy accident, but it's an accident. Okay. What if we look at other languages that didn't do that kind of thing by accident? Can we learn a bunch from them? And so that's what we, we try to, to go through this talk and try to see how we can, you know, hook up back onto, um, you know, onto something that makes sense for actual C++ code. So, if you didn't pick it out already by my horrendous accent, 
um, I happen to be French, and somehow by law, well, I need to speak about the very French things right now. So let's dip into another language called Objective Camel. So now I know what will happen. Okay, who ever heard about that? Yeah, okay, so keep your hands up. No, no, keep your hands up, okay. Okay, in all those people, who is actually French? Okay, fine, fine. Okay, fine. <laughs> I won't say anything. So, uh, well, what's, what's Objective Camel? Objective Camel is a somehow object-oriented implementation of a pure functional language called Camel, which is more specification than language. Pardon my my uh, vulgarization points there. It's, it's a purely functional language. That's one of these funny languages where everything is a function, including values, okay? And that no concept of, you know, memory, no concept of loops, no concept of, well, pretty much everything that makes your day-to-day um, -day work, uh, you know, uh, cool. It was heavily promoted by one of the main uh, French research center, which is the INRIA in the 90s. There is a, still a strong ongoing, you know, following on this language, which is actually quite cool. Okay, fine. Why the heck are we speaking about functional language? Well, functional languages, in general, are very fond of this notion of metaprogramming because, well, you know, you write code into a function, and the very basic paradigm of functional language that a function, you know, it's a value like any other. So you can have a function that, you know, take a function as a parameters, return a new function, and so on and so on. And having a way to aggregate function bodies or mixing them somehow is very useful in those language. And this, from there, the notion of metaprogramming, which is writing codes that write codes, you know, it just happens to pop out naturally. And at some point, I think it was around 2005 or six, uh, there was an extension for OKMR that I proposed, which was called Meta OKML. Things start to be interesting, you know when you start slapping meta on top of things, um, it actually proposed a way to express in itself, directly into camel, oh, camel, sorry, a way to say, yeah, you know, I really want to generate this code right now following these rules. And it's based on a very, very, very simple list of things. It separates cleanly what you want to generate from where you want to generate it and the non-generated code so it's something which is very, you know, separated, contrary to what we do. And, uh, well, you could actually put things into boxes, and those boxes were, could be used later. And that's one thing which is very cool into the language. They have a very, very powerful type system and a very powerful type checker, and your code fragment better behave with respect to these type checking things. So Mitao Kemmer gives us three tools, which is a brackets, which is a creation of a fragment of code. You can inject a code fragment into another using the escape rule. And once you finish putting your function in your function and your code in your code, you can actually get to the business by running the generated code. Small caveat, the metaprogramming that these things were doing was some kind more on a, of a runtime it's programming. The code was generated and executed at runtime because there is no um, compilation step in OKML. Um, I won't do the test, but I bet most of you are actually familiar even or only by name with Haskell. Yeah, Haskell has also, yeah, I see you over there. Uh, as an extension of what's called template Haskell, if my memory serves me right, and it was the same idea except it was actually compile time code generation. This thing is at runtime, but it doesn't change much for what, what we try to, to make apparent. So how does it work? Well, you will see that that's something that we basically make, you know. It will start to be looking familiar. So um, you can construct a code fragment in MetaOCaml using the dot brackets construction. So we start being, you know, with something familiar, you know, we, let's put some angry brackets somewhere, so, you know. And the funny thing is that, so you can type this into a meta or KML interpreter. And the interesting thing is that whenever you type something in KML, um, the uh, interpreter say, okay, I understand what you said, and this is a type of what you just typed. And the funny thing is there is that, okay, before Jens, you know, blame me for doing the wrong thing. The funny thing is 
fact that the type of A, it's a code that generates an int. And this very notion of code inside the type system is actually very interesting because it prevents you to mix code that will do something with something, which is not a piece of code. And so these one plus two things get into a box, and this box is stored into uh, this value A. And from now on, nothing is evaluated. We just wrote one plus two and put it into a box. Fine. So maybe we want to compose those code fragments. So we have this, oh god, uh, dot tilde things. Well, after you do this for a while, you look at C++ syntax and you say, no, actually it's fine. <laughs> Sorry, Xavier. Um, so, what happens with this? Um, dot tilde just take a code, something, and put it into another one. We cannot do three times A because A is not a value, it's a code generating a value. So, if we did that, the type checking things, we say, no, I wanted to do this. So, we have to uh, escape this dot tilde to put A inside B, which is itself a code fragment because of the brackets. And what does the type checker say is, oh yeah, I see what you did there. This is a piece of code again, generating an int, and you know what, actually, the code you wrote is three times one plus two, which is exactly what our intuition says. But still, yet again, nothing is evaluated. There is some type checking, there is another new code fragment, and you can do that a lot, and again and again, and at some point, you know, you have to do your job, okay, because you know, and so you can ask for evaluating something with the uh, dot bang operator. I think at some point they run out of key on the keyboard or something. I don't know. And the dot bang thing just take your code fragment, which was a code producing an int, and it runs a code. And when you run a code producing an int, what do you get? Well, spoilers, you get an int, which happens to contain the value you were looking for. So that's a very crude example. The very funny thing is that you could actually Work with this code things viable, you know, in the middle of regular code, like it was viable from anything else. And whenever you went, wanted to say, okay, now I know what I want to do, dot bang, do the right thing. And it was actually um, somehow elegant if you go past the fact that, yeah, the syntax, well, it is what it is, but we have to work with what's there, okay? But this notion of Write a piece of code, put it into a box, forget it until you need it, and uh, meanwhile you can do your normal code things and you can bring it back later. It's exactly what you want into a, a proper uh, code generation process. Uh, you could actually wrote large function with arbitrary control structures like switch or F or pattern matching because you really want to do pattern matching when you do this. To say, okay, if this happens, this is a piece of code you want to get, or if not, this is the other one, or and so on and so on, and call this code generating function one into the others until you get your complete metaprogramming piece of code, and then you dot bang it. And the funny thing is that this notion of conditional uh, or pattern matching based generation of code is exactly what you want to express. Oh, you know, you give me this option, that probably means that you need this code, or if you give me this one and such or such condition is true, you maybe want this one because I know it's better for you than the other pieces. And as this uh, type code things is a type in itself, you could actually have functions where the return type was, oh, I give you a code things that returns something later and you can take this, pass it to another function waiting for a fragment of code and so on and so on and so on. It was very elegant. Okay, fine. So three main things to remember. First one is this notion of code fragment. Code fragment is a basic abstraction uh, thing that you have to, to manipulate. Meta or Camel treated this code fragment as, as a first class object. Okay, you can put it into a value and put it somewhere else, pass it to a function, return it from a function. Type checking, which is a very fundamental piece of objective KML, still has to happen because you don't want people to mix code and value or the other way around. And the separation of concern between the construction of the code fragment, its composition or injection, as it was called, 
And the fact that once you finish, you can decide when and where to run it was actually very fundamental. So we spent a bunch of time trying to think, OK, what should I do if I want to translate this into an actual piece of C++ that makes sense? Well, code fragment, actually, we, we have it from a long time ago. I mean, if you wrote a function object, uh, which is an object with a function call operator, and you have this code into the function call operator, it's somehow a, a piece of code fragment because it's a box that you can store somewhere in the variable. And later, when you want to do it to do something, you can just call the function call operators. Happens that C++11 and 14 and so on uh, gave us something very interesting, which is lambda function, which is basically a massive syntactic shortcut for writing function objects. Uh, in a way which is sometimes more efficient than if you write it yourself because the compiler just has a code laying around and can make more uh, informed decisions about what to do with the code. And then, how do we want to inject code into another? Well, if my code fragments are function object or lambda function, same thing, okay. Well, whenever I call a function, I'm just telling the compiler to, okay, do whatever this function is supposed to do, so put the code there. And if the inlining systems of the compiler and the condition for inlining are smart enough, then the end result is actually dumping the code where, whenever you call the function. So we can inject using inline function calls. And the execution part, which was at runtime in Meta OCaml, you know what? Well, it's regular compilation. Once you finished writing all of this, your lambda in context that you can inline them and so on and so on, well, bang, compile and done. And the, con the question we had was, okay, but is using lambda function as, um, let's say, a glorified or at least um, a makeshift uh, code fragment orders, is it enough? And is a compiler able to see what we want to do in the end and just remove every extra news bits of function call and whatnot? So that was the, uh, the actual challenge we wanted to, to see if we can do it. So we spent a bunch of time trying to, to get some, you know, um, I would say that proof of concept things going on. And we wanted to see if on a regular actual life-sized example, uh, we could get somewhere. So let's see, let's see if we can actually transition from a type-based metaprogramming to what I would call uh, an injection-based template metaprogramming. So we won't, we won't be playing with types. That's so 1999, okay? <laughs> well, actually, uh, sorry, it's so 2003 or whatever. Um, we don't care about types. We won't be building fancy type lists and calling fancy threads, meta function, blah, 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 and so on and so on, even if it's interesting in your own terms. What we really want to be able to do is call as a compiler to generate the frigging code we want him to generate. So let's try to see if we can manage that. So, how do we do this? We have these things where we use lambdas, inline function calls, and we compile regularly, and that should be enough to emulate what things like meta camera were trying to do, or template task, or whatever. And uh, well, we went through a bunch of things. And the first thing we, we try to emulate is it's probably the very most simple thing, is what can you do if you put lambdas everywhere? You know, so we, we have these jokes uh, as a company uh, when we look at C17 and thing is how, how close are we so that 99% of the C++ code we wrote is either parents, square brackets, or auto. <laughs> thing is, we are that close actually. So, well, so what happens if we put lambdas everywhere and we treat it as a normal way to write code, right? Okay. Okay, you probably saw this example already. So the name of the function give it all. It's, it's a function that takes two functions, f and g. We don't really care about the type of f and g, actually. It could be whatever. And uh, what do we do? Well, we return this thing. Brackets equal brackets auto x. Uh, curly braces, piece of code, curly braces. Uh, and I forgot the semicolon again, whatever. Um, well, that was bound to happen anyway. Um, what, what is those things? 
Well, it's exactly what we do. I, my thesis is this is, this, this is not a function. It's a code injector. It's the most simple lambda-based metaprogramming things we can do. Because what are we doing? We are taking things that look like they should behave like functions, because we put parents on top of them, you know. But we don't, we don't compute f of g of x. We are just building a new piece of code in which sometimes, later, whenever, you don't know when, you will end up calling this with an actual x later at runtime that we go this. It's not a fancy function template. It's the most basic injection metaprogram ever. Now, how is it, uh, what, what makes these things possible uh, to fit in a single slide? Okay, because we have the C14 um, 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 polymorphic lambdas, which supports these auto parameters, we have this notion of I can capture whatever outside the, the lambdas and put it inside again, and I don't have to worry about how we do this. Is there is probably three to six people in the room that say, oh, you know, you should have passed those functions by every, uh, universal forwarding reference and so on and so on. Yes, that's just for the example, so bear with that. It's not perfect, just for, you know. And the other thing is this auto-return type without the trailing decal type from C++14, because we can just say, you know, my dear compiler, this is a piece of crap I want you to generate, and you probably know better than me what the type of this thing is, so please use it. And what, do we, can, what can we do with that? Well, stupid things. As we don't put any constraint of f and g, we just want them to be function, well, you can pass another lambda to compose or, or an actual read function. Okay, and uh, yeah, h, h is not a value. It's not sqrt of f applied to something, something. I have no x to call on this. It's another function object. But I happen to have generated by stapling those two things together with the help of the compiler. And then sometimes later, I'm just calling hash as if it was a regular function. And it happens to generate the code that should be the equivalent of calling two times square t of x, which is what I want. But instead of having to write it this way, I use this compose abstraction, put a bunch of function in it, ship it somewhere, use it later. And of course, I won't go there because, well, you know, slice was big enough. Well, how does h behave? Like a function, right? So we are completely re because you could actually use compose on something, get a new function that you can pass to another compose call, and so on, and so on, and so on. It's open-ended, okay? So that's a rather trivial example, but it occurs to me that this thing is metaprogramming, like the way we were doing before, and not just some random function template, because we do this Take a piece of code, staple them together. It happens to be another function, it could be something else. But that's the very basic things. You have to treat your code as things you can staple together, and one of the cool ways to do this is put your fragment of code into a lambda. And 99.9% .9 of the time, so this thing will do the right thing. We will take a look later at that. Okay, fine, yeah, I can compose functions, that's very cool, but you know, I'm here to do some serious metaprogramming, and uh, what I really, really want to be able to do, and, uh, well, oh well, is Vitoyo there? No, it's probably not. Okay, so Vitoyo Romero may, may make a blog post like this week about something very similar to what I will speak about. And uh, what I really want to do, you know, because I'm a grown-up man or woman uh, doing metaprogramming, I want to have something that can give you a random piece of code, and I want you to unroll it an arbitrary number of times, because, you know, that's what serious code is all about. Okay, can I actually write some kind of generic code unroller that take an arbitrary piece of code that may or may not be um, um, parameterized by a, a static index, which would be the, you know, the index... Um, a repetition uh, number, 
And I will just replicate this damn code x time with a different value for the index in a way that the code generated just basically looks like you wrote a damn macro to enroll the thing or you just copy past the thing, you know, like, like you should not. And uh, okay, so what do we do? Well, we have code fragment. We know that we can put that into a lambda. Okay, fine. Uh, what do I do for the other parts? So if you pay attention to the title of the, of the talk, well, you know where I'm going there. We already have a way to replicate things in controlled context in C++14 and so on. It was just under our nose. We need a way to say this is a piece of code, replicate it some amount of time. Well, what if we have something to say, yeah, I, I can actually replicate it some amount of time, but are you okay with getting comma, you know, in between the replication? Well, actually we are. That's a job for the dot, 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 via the pack expansion things. Dot, dot, dot is not just these things that you can slap onto type names or ints or your variadic function templates so you can get an arbitrary number of parameters and call it a day. Dot, dot, dot is applicable on an arbitrary expression as long as it contains something which come out of a variadic pack. So let's abuse it, you go. Again, you know. So just for having something, so type name dot, 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 we have this notion of pack of types. You can expand that, and as I say, you can expand that into whatever you want because whatever is on the um, left side of the dot, dot, dot can be whatever. As long as something in the whatever comes out from the pack. And uh, so the question is, where can I actually put that so I can get my code and roll of things running? Well, we need a place where I can, you know, put things and put comma between the things. It happens that we have a bunch of places where we can do that. Uh, one of them being, you know, um, array initialization or function calls, thing like this. Um, so we need some kind of framing device so we can have, you know, a box in, in, into which we can unroll the things. And um, a very interesting thing that it happens, it happens that this notion of I just want to replicate a bunch of code with something in between uh, was actually so prevalent that in C17 we end up having a new form of expression to express this with the generalized fold expression. And fold expression is basically this, you know, turn to 11 so we can actually do meaningful things with less, you know, syntactic clutter. So how does these things can look like? Okay, so let's have a look. Okay, that's a piece of code, okay? So, well, I want to be able to say, this is a piece of code, can you just, you know, call it with different values and do it a given amount of time? One of the first way we are taught to manipulate variety packs is to work with recursions over the pack structures. I have something and then a variety tail. I do something and I call myself on the tail. Uh, that's not the correct way to do it for many reasons. One of the correct way to do it is try to use a place where you can just slap a dot, dot, dot and call it a day. And uh, one thing that came out after C14 that the one thing we really want to be able to do is do this dot, dot, dot thing with a series of numbers. Because we can use the numbers to do funny things inside. So C14 gives us a bunch of tools. One of those tools is this make integer sequence things. Make integer sequence, take a types, an integral types, and a value, and it will generate the type, which is, where is it? Uh, yeah, integer sequence over there. And integer sequence is basically a type, which is a type of the value in the meta box, okay? And the viadic pack of integers that go from zero to uh, the number of uh, we requested into uh, make integer sequence minus one. And the funny thing is that it gives us a single point that requires a viadic template parameters on which we will be able to unroll using the dot 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 unroller thing. And as I say, we need a place where we can actually do this, do a things, comma, do a things, comma, do a thing. Okay. 
So you can put that into an array, or like some of the people, like Eric Nieber showed already, we can actually put that into a, an initializer list. So what is this thing? Well, <clears throat> well, well, well. So apparently I'm calling f, that looks like a function. You know, we know that because it's called f. Um, and what do we pass to f? We pass an instance of this integral constant things, okay, which is a, a type that embed an, an integral constant in its type. And the value we put into this integral constant uh, depend on is. And I, I construct my integral constant. I'm closing my function call. And because I cannot know what f does, I mean, maybe it returns nothing, maybe it returns a double, or maybe it's a very crooked piece of code. And it returns a type that depends on the value I pass to it. And if I want to put that into an initializer list, I need a single type, so I just you know, use the comma operator to say, yeah, do f of your thing, and then return zero, okay? And I will take this long expression, all these parentheses things, from there to there, and these things is an expression that happens to depend on this variadic parameter, so I can slap this dot, dot, dot thing on top of that. And what does this thing do? Well, let's say you call that for an integer sequence of 0, 1 to 3, you will end up with f on something of 0, comma 0, comma from the pack expansion, f on integral constant of something from 1, comma 0, comma something on 2, something on 3. And we will call all those f functions with a different integral constant carrying a different value. And we will generate as much of those calls as we require from the number of elements into the variadic pack of the integer sequence. On a scale from 0 to what the heck is this thing and how can I have come up with this crap, it's a solid 9. But Bjarne is not there this year, so he cannot check his hand, you know, he disbelieves that we, we did that with his beloved language. So we Bjarne. Uh, it's actually not that, you know, it's not that intuitive. It's not that something you will wake up on one morning and say, oh yeah, of course I need to do that. <laughs> or if you do, send me an email because we are hiring, okay? <laughs> <laughs> but, if you, if you slice everything, I mean, there is no, I mean, we are not abusing any hole into the standard. Everything is standard there. Um, I have a standard use of dot, dot, dot because of IS. I have a standard use of this comma operator. And I have a standard use of initializer list. Everything is purely standard. Yes, it's crooked, but it's fair game. So what happened? What, what, why, why are we doing this thing with start? Well, Maybe you want to unroll something, and you want to unroll it between two, you know, a start and, and an end point in integer, so we just shift the thing. Uh, we, you won't be calling this. You will be calling the other one behind, which is this, uh, which is like the public interface for this four context per thing. And what do you do? Well, you say, you know, I will give you a function f of type fun, you know, and I want you to do some kind of context before between this value, this starting value s, up to the ending value e. So I'm passing f to the other guy upstairs. I'm building this sequence of variadic pack of integers. How many integers do I have? I have probably something like e minus s plus one or something. Okay. Um, like we like to say, you know, in those fancy math book. Uh, if you want to have this working with an S, which is smaller than an E and a negative step, uh, you can do that at home. And we pass the S so we know where to start the countdown from. Okay. Well, looks fun. For some definition of fun, of course. Uh, that's the C++ 14 version. And as I say, this notion of I really want to replicate a piece of code with an arbitrary binary operator in between instead of just comma, end of quote, was so prevalent that we ended up with C++17 fold expression. 
So if you were writing this in C++17, it looks slightly better. And in my opinion, it looks far better. Why? Because we rely on the fact that comma, well, it's an operator. It happens to be binary, so I happen to be able to call it with dot, dot, dot. So I can generate a full expression around the comma operator. I don't have all this crooky syntax based on the fact that I need to build an initializer list that contains an integer and so on and so on. I have a piece of code separated by comma. Please do that for every piece of code you find out. It's a bit more elegant. Well, OK, fine. What should I do with this? Can I actually do something? Well, it's, you know, it's a metaprogramming talk, so, and we are pretty much inside it right now, so it's probably time to, you know, do some Godbolt or something, you know, because it gets, uh, okay, fine. Windows, don't fail me, please. Is it? <laughs> okay, thank you, Windows. Okay. Let's do it this way. Okay, fine. So how does it work? Does it work? It works. So that's three or four years now that I came to uh, meeting C++ and other conferences, and uh, I learned something very valuable is, well, you, you should prepare your code example in query before end and not try to be too smart and code live them, okay? So I just wrote whatever we were writing in the slide upstairs, okay? Um, so this is this initial resolution. Is it big enough for everybody in the back? Is it okay? Yep. Yeah? Okay, well, let's be sure. So we do this integral sequence things that we saw, and we have this four const expert. I will jump over that, and uh, let's write one of these fancy things where you say, okay, let's build, you know, a Christmas tree of uh, stars with this triangle thing, you know, that uh, if you were in, a, in an engineering school somewhere doing computer science, you probably wrote that once in your life. But I really want to do that at compile time because, you know, that's the best time to do things. Um, so what do I do? Um, yeah, look like I, I stage the thing so it looks almost like a regular for loops. Keyword is almost. So what do I do? I want to for const explorer something between indexes from one to four. Fine. And what do I want to do? Well, I want to do this piece of code, which is parameterized by this i thing. And this i, for each iteration, is a different integral constant. So the type of i change at every iteration. So we need polymorphic lambdas and the auto things. And what I want to do is, for each value of i, I want to make another loop inside that goes from 1 to i, and this guy has another index, g, and well, what we do, we just print g star one after the others. It kind of looks like a regular for loops, like you have a four things with numbers and piece of code, and you can nest one into the others. Can you, can you guess what's funny on line 31? There is something funny. Yes. Yeah, I, I have i, which is uh, it looks like a runtime parameters from the lambda, and uh, you know I willy nilly put it into a context per context, without doing something like decal type of i colon colon value because I know it's an integral constant. So question. Okay, is it is it something correct, or? Is it something that GCC does behind my back as an extension? Well, I have i, which is of some types. And integral constants happens to have an operator, a commercial operator, to the integral types it contains. And I think since C++11, this commercial operator is const expert. It better be, because the integral you put inside, I mean, it's a constant. Okay, so it has to be, cons it should be context per. So my uh, interpretation of this is probably standard because the commission operator kicks in to turn the integral constant into an integer because the commission operator exists and as it is context per, it's allowed in this context. 
Now, if anybody has an actual clue on that, I will be very glad to discuss that because I'm still not sure uh, GCC is not doing something it should not. And by, you know, imitation, Clang does the same, but well, whatever. I think it's standards. But it's funny because then it looks really like what you would write into a regular uh, for loop, uh, you know, with the nested for loops things. You just take the, in the index of the other one and you put it there and it's, and it's done. That's actually funny. And then you use J there, uh, G, sorry, in the, into the string constructor, regular things, no problem. So I would just hide that for a while. And so what does this thing should be doing? So last time I did that, it compiled, so. It did. So I go from one to four. When I is equal to one, I'm calling the um, G loop between one and one. And then when it's equal to two, it goes from one to two and one to three and one to four. So I should end up with one point and two, two lines and three and four lines, which is, looks roughly what it is. Okay. Except, okay, I, I knew it would happen. Uh, okay, so don't move. I, I handle that. I should have known this. Happens to me all the time. Yeah, better. But fine, well, okay. Probably the most stupid sample we could have get there, but it, it gets the point across. Um, so we can actually do this, and uh, nothing prevents us to put another Falcon Stexper into the lambda you pass to the first one, and um, you probably need to just use the index into one of the other, and you can do it directly. Uh, you probably need a, a, refer a capture specifier if you want to use i inside the other lambda, but everything is normal, sort of. And, uh, well, okay, fine. We, we have a very nice thing uh, using a lot of angry brackets and dot, dot, dot to display this wonderful tree of stars. Uh, maybe we can do better, actually. So what about an actual, <laughs> an actual useful thing? Now, let's have a look at that. Again, the name is, this is a function we are looking at. Okay. The name is giving it already. Um, what if I want to take a function, and what I want to generate is the series of function call of this function f over all the members of a given tuple? Whatever the tuple size, and whatever the tuple contents, and whatever if the tuple type is an actual tuple or not, but as long as it behaves correctly with std get and std tuple size. Well, well, that's easy. It's a for loop. For every member of the tuple, do the thing. So that we can translate it to for every member, for every index member of the tuple from zero to the last one, duplicate the following code, which just say call f on the if element of the tuple t using std get. And again, we do this funky, put the i directly into the template context so it looks funny. Notice that one liner, as long as we have four const expert, and, well, it behaves like you will think it behaves. So I would just, you know, plug the Christmas tree off. And so you can write things like this. Let's put it on two lines so it's more, a bit more readable. Uh, this is the thing I want to do, so I went with the most trivial example of printing every member. Uh, could do far more than that. And this is a tuple I have. And what I want to do is for every piece of the tuple, please just print it. OK, fine. Well, and that's, that's the part that I like, because we got through this abstraction of this. This is a piece of code, please enroll. And we slap it something on top of it and say, OK, this is a tuple. Please walk through it. And we reuse this abstraction of let inject this piece of code repeatedly to end up with something that looks like a nice piece of code, okay? And obviously, it does what you think it does, except you can see it. Oh, but we go over. It's still, you know, as is a very rough example, uh, it lacks a lot of things, it lacks a lot, it lacks support for actual uh, forwarding references if I want to call a function on the top all that may or may not modify it. 
I need to pass tuple as a, a universal reference. We probably need a bunch of ending of const explorer and no except, but that's something you can, you know, put on it afterwards. But the basic thing is we have this dot, dot, dot things combined with this lambda code things that end up doing what it was. Okay, now I promise you we need to do some god bolting. So what does this thing do when I look at the generated code? Do I get this very tight replication of the code or is at some point the compiler just, you know, like, okay, I throw it up, I don't know what you want to do, have your function calls. Yeah, let's have a look. So same code, okay, put it over there. I would just, again, remove this because, you know, assembly code with C out is a bit complicated. Don't die on me, got bored, thank you. Uh, is it big enough? Yeah, probably. So I expect to get some amount of call to um, basic IO stream operator insertion, blah, 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 for every piece of the tuple. And that's basically what we got. If I'm not mistaken, yeah, so I call operator for an int, operator for a basic or stream for whatever it is, yeah, for, for const things and for double and, uh, and so on and so on. Uh, what do I have in my, in my tuple already? I don't remember. Yeah. So I end up with the proper numbers of uh, things. Okay. So we have one insertion, two insertion, and so on, and so on, and so on. And if I look at the, con the constant these things look for, yeah, we, we have what we need over there. Uh, where is LC0? Yeah, LC0 is this. This is a large string, and so on, and so on. So we have no trace of calling this actual lambda operator function, whatever. Everything gets in line somehow magically because the compilers well, it has access to the old code block into the lambda, so it can decide what you want to do. But this is no magic trick. If you keep pining up things like this or starting to put complex code into your lambda, into the, this automatic enroller, at some point the compiler will say, no, screw you, I'm not inlining these things. So you have to be careful. Uh, I wish, but I don't think it's possible. You cannot, you cannot force inline lambdas, as ugly as it sounds. Uh, force in line is actually something that is, in some cases, still required for this kind of code to work. Uh, we expect that actual code injection will get rid of the need to do uh, force in lining, but for now we have to deal with that. Okay, fine. I got a very funny thing, so I can actually print tuple members, and I can, you know, print a nice amount of stars to, that looks like a Christmas tree. Okay, what, what if we actually do something interesting with that? So, well, uh, we happen to work on, on different amount of library uh, for our customers, and most of them have this requirement of being high performance for whatever definition of high performance. Um, so I heard that linear algebra is still a thing, and that's a very important thing to uh, optimize, and you may be familiar with OpenBLAS, which is a monster of software engineering that, that deal with a lot of architectures and inline assembly and other things like this that you don't really want to do to give you an actual very efficient basic linear algebra routines on a lot of platforms. Uh, it's cool. I mean, it do a great job, but I mean, we are in 2017 and I'm, we were kind of sure that we don't need that much assembly to get to this level of performance. So we took our small code enroller, we shake it with our uh, vectorization library, and uh, we debug it. And can we have a matrix vector multiply written in 100% C++, no assembly, no acts depending on the architecture, just plain call to basic C++ with, with a strong support for uh, the vectorization layer? And can we be competitive with this massive effort that is open blast? Well, we found out that we can, actually. And, well, not that bad. So that's the memory uh, throughput of our um, matrix vector multiplication things on an x86 machine using AVX2. So the dark red is open blast, and the pinkish thing is us. 
So we're not that bad. Even when we start breaking the, the cash and everybody goes down, we are still doing something interestingly. Um, so 128 cases is a bit of an outlier for some reasons. I uh, he doesn't know. Uh, but yeah, we, we are pretty much holding ourselves. And in, on the small sizes, we can even outperform open brass. But yeah, but well, x86, you know, that's so mainstream. So can we do the same on power? Uh, the fact is, yes, we can, actually. Uh, so big red, small pink. Uh, we have something which is very more flat because cash on power rate are so big, you have to work a lot before breaking them. And so we, we hold our together, a couple of percents of difference. But you know, power is so corporate, you know. So what happens if we, if we go on a small machine, you know, with an ARM processor, uh, and can we actually be competitive with handwritten neon things written by, you know, I don't know, people that do that for a living, or we are stranded with, you know, our poor C++ things. Happens that we still can do something. We, we are worse in the biggest cases for some reasons, I suspect OpenBlast is using prefetching, and we don't, and we should. But all this code was written using actual C++14, those lambda slash enrolling slash template metaprogramming tricks. And, and there is zero percent specific assembly into this. And we are still managing to get there. And uh, if you are not familiar with this kind of, um, of kernel, matrix vector multiplication is really something you, you need to work Sorry for, for sorry, sorry for what I would say. You need to work your ass off to get some decent performance. And we demonstrated that we can actually do, go there with no more, well, sorry, <laughs> with just C++. I won't say no more because I will get, you know, angry comments on YouTube and so on. Well, well whatever. <laughs> so we can do that. And that was actually our, we were very proud of that because we, we thought about this thing about, yeah, you know, lambdas enroll them, use this dot, dot, dot things, and try to make it so the compiler is about to, dis, to, dis, to, sorry, to find out whatever was needed to enroll the things perfectly. There was one thing we needed to do there at some point. Uh, for some version of this code, we have to ditch the lambda because we were requiring it to be a force in line. So that's something we still need to work out. It probably needs to be solved by the compiler. So as a conclusion, before I get kicked, so, okay, just some, some raw take-home things. We can, metaprograms, as the name implies, are programs. There is no reason we cannot write them in a way they look like regular programs. No need of an arbitrary amount of angry brackets doing things on type in type list and so on. We can actually write code that manipulate regular piece of you know, lambdas and things, and we can torture them into something else. This is a code generator. It's not a type wrangler that slap, you know, type onto types onto types until you instantiate your things. You manipulate code fragment, and that's, that's the way it should be. And by using the native tools that the, that the compiler gives us, the lambdas, the variadics, the, all these context per things that were underlying this, we are about to be, uh, we are about to write codes that just do exactly what we want them to do, without having to go through extra new sense of ugly code, just a, a, a small amount of ugly code. And uh, we have expectation on these things. I mean, I mean, Bustana and the reflection things come from different angle. Uh, we came from a very ad hoc, hands-on approach. But I think we are converging to the same point where, in a world in 2020-something, when we will have reflection at compile time and, and context per block and things like that, all of this could actually be written in a way that you don't even have to have the lambdas. You can actually put a context per block around your code and done. And you can ask inject to, to do these unrolling things. Um, this, this thing is actually what we want to do. But the question is, Maybe we should need something on top of these basic reflection things. Maybe, a, you know, I mean, the reflection is made so we can actually build library out of it. So maybe we can actually, you know, uh, get a small code generator library out of that thing so you can actually do all of this with still having a level of abstractions. And one of those things that 
we want, and that's coming sooner than that, is context for lambda. So we can actually put a lambda in more contexts where we can actually control when this lambda is evaluated to be sure that everything is actually done when it should be done, which is compile time. So thanks for your attention. Uh, I hope there is still a bunch of time for small questions. And uh, thank you for coming there. If you have any questions, please go so far. Thank you. So if you have, if you have any questions, you can just go to the microphone. <laughs> so the question is, I don't want to be pedantic, but, you know. <laughs> okay, do I have the authorization to, to use that in first of all because that's very well explained. Okay, yeah. If the return type of f has a frigging overloaded operator, what happens? Well, you probably need a bunch more parents thingy thingy. Uh, I wrote that on top of my head, but yeah, in the actual code, we have the extra cast avoid and thing and so on. Uh, but my actual answer to that is, if you are in a context that some of your coworkers give you a function that return a type which has an operator comma overloaded, you should have a talk with him <laughs> or her. Okay. Yeah, okay, fine. So we should talk, okay? Now, yeah, that, that's a very, on a condensed thing, yeah, you, you need a bit more. That's why the actual uh, C++ 17 thing is actually better. Or maybe we still need void around that, okay. Or maybe we should ask the standard to ban, you know, overloading on the comma operator or something, but yeah. Um, I think the, in this case, you still need something around F, I think. Uh, no, no, we don't, because you don't care about the type return because you just comma them and you discard everything, so you don't care. You care in the initialization example because you need to be sure you get an integer. In this case, you don't care. You return whatever and the comma things do the thing. Yeah, comma may have a side effect, but again, we need to talk if that's the case, but yeah, well, sure, sure. As I say, this is a basic rough sketch. If you want to have something perfect, I mean, you, you need a lot of, you know, small detail like this, including that, yeah. Thank you. Another question? Yeah, um, so when you're using the um, loop on roller in production, how do you find the debugging experience? Oh, so do we have any debugging experience on the code on the roller? Um, well, yes. It's not that bad. Um, depending, on the com well, depending on the debugger, um, either you have a very strange behavior because you, you, when you look at the assembly, you are somewhere, and, and, the, and the, you know, the, uh, where I am in the source code just you know, keep jumping because it's completely lost. But usually it's around the place where you call it. So you can actually guess what happens. Uh, and in other cases, it's, you know, you follow the assembly and you stick where you are. So it's okay-ish. Um, well, it's not perfect, um, but it's something that is manageable because the, um, most debugger, I mean, if I go back to the actual example, because it's probably, oh, no, it won't be easier if I do it this way. It would be easier if I do it this way. I mean, I mean, if you, if you were debugging this, uh, you would jump there. Okay, by, by doing so. And uh, whenever you hit a std get of f, the, the, conf the debugger still ping you there. It doesn't ping you in this mess. And that's, that's okay. Um, we, we had a bunch of cases where probably we, we over abused it, you know, like, and uh, the, yes, the debugger was completely bonkers. And uh, we say, okay, we, we, we would write, you know, like, an actual uh, decent set of unit tests so we can actually, uh, you know, be sure that we go through everything that can happen and see what's going on. And if anything fails, then we will debug a very smaller cases. It's a bit cumbersome, and that's why I hope that all the actual reflection-based systems that I hope will be available at some point, we will get rid of that, and the debugger will just see, you know, the actual generated code and, and do the translation. But I think it's more a problem of actually understanding what's going on. But, well, but actually, you, you are at the place you want to be, even if it looks funny. You are not inside the bowels of the things. Yeah. All right, thanks. Can Thank you also you. turn on 
Sorry? O zero. Can you turn on O zero in that code and see what happens? Oh yeah, yeah. You want O zero on that? Oh God. I'm not sure it will fit. No, I'm joking. Actually, you can go to O2 and O1. It's still doing the right thing. You really have to ask for no optimization for getting this. Oh, zero, I said. Thank you. Yeah, well, you know, push ABP, blah, blah, blah. It's a thing. What about calling the constructor of tuple while we are at it, you know? And yeah, we call for each member on these funny things. Okay, on this funny thing. I don't even know where is it, actually. Oh, it's, no, that's a DK thing. Where, oh, yeah, for each member. So you have an actual function call. Oh, God. And then you call the other one, of course, which is, oh, yeah, I, I like when you do this, you know, like when, you're, when your compiler has to, you know, generate code for STD forwards, you, you know that you are in a world of pain. Uh, where is this thing, actually? Where is the four context? Oh, yeah, it's there. Yeah, well. Uh, what does it do, actually? Oh, yeah, I, I call the other guy with the proper things. Okay, fine. Which is probably somewhere else. Yeah, yeah, around there, I guess. Yeah, it looks like it is, yeah. And, uh, yeah, and so you have this tuple element, call the thing, blah, 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 et cetera, et cetera. So it's, it's actually okay. -ish. I mean, you don't get that much cruft more than when you expect to have a zero, O0 zero code, you mean? I mean, it's bad, but we, we know what we, are, what we are asking for, so, but it's okay. It's okay, it's not that bad. But you don't want to do that. Use all three people, please, you know, like, make me a favor. Okay, another question? Yeah. Yeah, quick question. Can I ask a question on Compose? Yep. Uh, so, you say that it could be improved. There's just one thing I'd, I'd like to know how to improve it. So it's taking an auto X, which would make a copy. Oh, yeah. Yeah, yeah, it should be, it should be L value ref and so on and so on. As I said, it's very crude thing. I mean, you should have forwarding reference everywhere and, and STD forward everything and so on. Yeah. So that would be auto ref ref and std forward of X? Yeah. All right, thanks. I mean, I mean, if you want to really be, you know, like strictly pedantic, you, you should do that. I mean, you are in a generic context, doesn't know what's coming up. F or G can be, you know, waiting for an actual reference or not. You may or may not want to copy F and G. So, yeah, you need, you need actual uh, support for L value or L value. Just, I mean, just, you know, simplify. So, thank you. So, last, last question and we are done. Hi, Joe. Hey. Um, you you uh, showed us how you needed to get out of the type system yep. for your needs. Yep. Uh, it seems like it's, it's a um, parallel endeavor to uh, other approaches, new approaches to reflection in C++, like Sutter's uh, proposal. Yep. Um, do you think there'll be any overlap between what you're trying to do, which is code generation, and what they're trying to do, which is type generation? Will, okay. will, it, will it, like... Okay, Converge so, together again or yeah. something. So the question is, how does these things overlap with uh, certain style uh, reflection, which is more based on sticking things into types? My, uh, my expectation is that this can be built on top of actual type-based reflection by actually building the types, I mean, building the types that contains the required member function or members that allow us to do this without having to do it, you know, you know, through, oh no, you know, um, um, a substitution of that. Uh, because being able to, inject, you can inject, uh, in the latest proposal, you can actually inject member function directly into a new type using the reflection things. So one thing we can do is just, you know, we, we take a your structure that we inject, you know, the so whatever we need to be replicated or, or reducted or whatever, and then we instantiate this reflection created types and then you do whatever we need to do. And so we don't have to worry about is the inlining correct, is the, uh, the compiler bitching about something which it should not. Because we use the native way of the compiler to build the type that contains the code that we want to run. For me, it's, uh, I mean, it's a stepping stone. And as I say, maybe at some point, what we'll be uh, figuring out is that we need some kind of library on top of the raw reflection 
so we can do this. That's, that's where I want to, to go, actually. I want to write this with the most naive, uh, sorry, native uh, regular standard uh, and regular usage of the language instead of trying to act, act, act around it, okay? But I think it's a, it's a stepping stone for us. We will probably have a new way to express this in a more um, idiomatic way in, in the next standard. So thank you, everybody. <laughs>